Welcome everyone, I'm Noah Reed, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test. Thank you all for joining us for this rescheduled webinar from February with our very own clinical educator, Dr. Allison Smith. With stress, insulin resistance, inflammation, and increased adiposity at the root of many patient presentations these days associated with estrogen dominant symptoms often lead patients to seek care. In this month's presentation, Dr. Smith will explore where excess estrogens are most likely coming from, the relative balance between estrogen and progesterone, and how the roots of estrogen metabolism can help determine a well-informed treatment plan. This webinar is designed to help the provider tackle common estrogen dominance complaints with the most specific and effective treatments the first time by using the Dutch test to identify the most likely source of the issue. If you're ready to start using Dutch Test in your practice, sign up as a registered provider today. Click the link we've posted in the chat and complete our provider application form. A member of our onboarding team will walk you through the steps to set up an account so that you can begin taking advantage of all the educational resources Dutch has to offer. Plus, registered providers gain access to the Mastering Functional Hormone Testing Course, the Dutch Interpretive Guide, and one-on-one -on -one consultations with Dutch clinical educators. This dedicated support and education is designed to help you become the hormone expert. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Allison Smith, ND, completed her education at National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. She worked in private practice focusing on primary care, women's health, and dermatologic laser therapy. Over the last 10 years, she has consulted with providers on thousands of cases in the context of hormone testing and brought awareness to testing to providers in clinical practice through the consulting, webinars, case presentations, and articles. She now leads an esteemed lineup of clinical educators at Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test. And now, without further ado, let's get started with today's webinar. Thanks, Noah, so much. Uh, today, we are talking about how to help our patients achieve that elusive, elusive hormone balance between progesterone and estrogen. We're going to cover a little medical disclaimer before we get started. All the slides that follow are provided as informational resources and should not be taken as medical advice or as a substitute for professional diagnosis and treatment. So as compelling as it all may sound. Um, so today we're talking about estrogen dominance in cycling females with a review of the menstrual cycle. You know, a lot of us have to kind of go back and remind ourselves of when estrogen dominance might be normal and progesterone dominance might be normal. Um, and most importantly, and really what this whole talk is about, is how to assess, you're really using a three-step uh, protocol, um, how to assess and treat estrogen-dominant patients from the tip of the iceberg all the way down to the foundation. The Dutch requisition form, if you've ever looked at it, and on the back side on page two, there's a question there that says, um, what are the top issues you're hoping the Dutch test will help you resolve? And patients are supposed to fill that out. Um, and I'm always surprised at how many people thoughtfully and earnestly answer this question. Um, uh, and most folks in some way, shape, or form will say, I hope to achieve hormone balance, hormone balance, hormone balance. Um, even on male reports, male reports and female reports, the requisition forms, so, you know, to me, this is almost like an affirmation or a, a statement of intention in a way, not so much for us at the lab, but more for the patient's uh, intention for wellness. Hormone balance is the goal for so many of us. So estrogen and progesterone balance dictates the health of more than just our reproductive system. We think of it an awful lot for fertility issues or for um, cycle issues, but uh, it has a hand in our immune function, our neurotransmitter balance, our cardiovascular and integument. Um, it plays a role in our gut microbiome. So if you have patients with complaints, really in any of these areas, you should be thinking about estrogen and progesterone balance. When there's imbalance, we know something is off. You know, as females who are cycling, we have this sense that uh, that rhythmic rise and fall of estrogen and progesterone is connected to the way we feel in our bodies. Um, so what does that mean when someone says they're experiencing hormone imbalance? Um, there are many, many presentations. This is just you know, a slide to give you an idea of the many, many things people might present with. They could be 
mental emotional presentations. Others are more physical and can be cyclic, you know, and others signal a more ex estrogen linked uh, dysfunction like chronic inflammation or adipose tissue dysfunction or autoimmune disease progression. So, but not all estrogen dominance is bad. So this is why we're gonna kind of go back to the beginning a little bit. Um, there are times in the menstrual cycle during which a little bit of estrogen dominance is totally normal and totally healthy. Um, and times when progesterone dominance is normal and healthy. And the hormone fluctuation between these states can be a trigger for symptoms. So that time after ovulation when estrogen is dropping, or that time at the end of the uh, menstrual cycle before menses where estrogen and progesterone are both dropping. Um, so we need to understand the menstrual cycle to kind of understand where these imbalances might occur. So here is a normal menstrual cycle as depicted on a dried urine cycle map. Uh, here we have estrogen up top and beta pregnanediol, which is the surrogate marker for progesterone in serum uh, or in urine. Um, the x-axis represents time or the cycle day in this case. And then the y-axis is the level or the result. So just to kind of orient you to a, what a cycle map would look like. So here in gray is the normal menses time, which is usually about five days in length or so, five to seven days. Um, and the follicular phase follows. And the follicular phase hallmark is really, um, you know, quiet hormones, really through menses and early follicular is a time of mostly adrenal output of sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone. Uh, once ovulation starts to occur, we have this periovulatory phase here, um, you'll start to see estrogen is skyrocketing as you're developing a follicle and there's a dominant follicle that's making lots of estrogen. Um, that and a little blip on the radar of progesterone down here is going to signal LH that it is time to ovulate. And then we have a shift in power. Um, the estrogens come down and we have a rise in progesterone and progesterone dominance is normal. Here's the mid luteal time we like people to collect their samples. Um, we ask people to collect in the middle of the luteal phase because we can glean the trifecta or what I like to call the trifecta. If you have a normal estradiol and progesterone in the mid luteal phase, it suggests that you have not only uh, developed a follicle, but you have also ovulated and you have a sufficient luteal phase. Those are three key pieces of information that we want. So you'll notice in the periovulatory phase, we're naturally estrogen dominant, and that's just to kind of reiterate that there. That's a totally normal time. If you have a patient collect their samples in the periovulatory time, they are going to be estrogen dominant and they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be. You're not supposed to have high or dominant progesterone during the periovulatory phase. Things wouldn't work properly. Here in the luteal phase though, if you're estrogen dominant, that's when people are gonna be experiencing symptoms of breast tenderness and maybe heavy menses later on. Um, and so these are things that we're looking for in the luteal phase where you know, estrogen dominance signals problems. Okay. So remember, a Dutch urine hormone test is collected during that mid-luteal phase. It's kind of the take-home point. And it doesn't mean that you can't test at other times of the cycle, but you need to reset your expectations. If you uh, test early in the follicular phase, both estrogens and progesterones should be hanging around that postmenopausal range. It's only adrenal output that you're looking at. Totally normal. That's not a menopausal patient. They're just in the follicular phase. And then if you test them in that periovulatory phase and their estrogens are jumping off the ranges and they're really high and the progesterone's low, that doesn't necessarily mean that your patient is estrogen dominant, it just means they're about to ovulate and that's okay. Um, and in the luteal phase, when we're looking here, that's when we can make all of those associations with follicle development, ovulation, and luteal sufficiency. So before we can understand estrogen dominance, we have to understand what both progesterone and estrogen are bringing to the table. So a lot of people think progesterone is something we just have in the luteal phase, um, but we actually have it in much larger amounts then. You know, the ovaries kind of kicked in and we're making a lot. But even in the, the follicular phase and menses times, all cycle long, progesterone is always eclipsing estrogen. So progesterone in the serum is reported in nanograms per mil, with a typical range usually going from about six to 22. 
Um, luteal estradiol seems so much larger because uh, you know, its range goes from 50 to 300 uh, in the luteal phase, but notice the units, picograms per mil versus nanograms per mil. Um, so you know, the amount of estrogen in the serum is so much smaller uh, than the amount of progesterone at any time of the cycle. So really progesterone is always dominant, if you think about it, in the body during, uh, during menses, during follicular phase, uh, and in luteal phase. So even when it's coming mostly from the adrenals earlier in the cycle. So if you're wondering how serum estradiol and progesterone correlate with urinary findings, this graph represents the correlation between the Dutch four-spot uh, four urine and serum. So here's estradiol, pretty close, and then the beta-pregnane diol and the progesterone also follow that nice same uh, correlation. So we, we use beta-pregnane diol as a surrogate marker for progesterone. That's important. We need a lot of progesterone uh, because it's inhibitory, it's stabilizing, it's tempering, whereas estrogen is very stimulatory, it's proliferative, it's tissue growing and activating. So we need it in smaller, more focused amounts and with proper controls in place. Progesterone is that control. Um, estrogen's perfect counterpart and really kind of vice versa. They really temper each other. Um, so how can we determine if someone is estrogen dominant? We can use a simple calculation that we'll talk about next slide. So this is really step one. Um, so we're gonna do kind of a three-step approach. Step one is assessing this progesterone estradiol ratio to determine somebody's um, progesterone deficiency or estrogen dominance compared to progesterone. Um, and to really determine the opportunity to treat with progesterone supporting uh, treatments. So determining the progesterone estradiol ratio is gonna be based on the cycle phase you're testing in. So if you're looking at a follicular, Sample, you know, 50 to 300 might be normal. I would argue that the best time to look at progesterone estradiol ratios is that luteal phase, uh, because that is a time when progesterone really should be taking the front seat um, significantly. And if it's not, those are usually um, symptomatic patients, usually. Um, essentially, we're, when we're looking at urinary levels, we wanna divide the beta-pregnane diol result by the estradiol result. That gives you the, uh, uh, the ratio pretty easily. Uh, and I'll present some cases later where progesterone estradiol ratio in the luteal phase when we're looking at a urine or even a serum test may give you a, an underrepresentation, or excuse me, an overrepresentation of PGE2 ratio where maybe they'll look progesterone dominant, they're really not. We have to look at some of the estrogen metabolites sometimes to determine that. So we'll tee up some extra cases. But in general, we like to look at PGE2 ratios just to get an idea of somebody's luteal um, progesterone dominance. You can also do this in serum. So you're not limited to just doing it on a Dutch test. You can also use your serum uh, values of progesterone divided by estradiol, but you'll need to change those units. So remember, um, estradiol's in the picograms. They both need to be uh, in nanograms to get that calculation to work out correctly. Otherwise, you have to multiply, um, you know, by a, a factorial there. Uh, but here you can see the example of an estradiol level of 180 and a progesterone level of 8. When you do the math, you can see that this patient is pretty estrogen dominant. That's a low progesterone estradiol ratio. That's how that works. So let's get used to doing the calculation. So here's the sex hormone page of a Dutch report. So if we want to find the progesterone estradiol ratio, we have to find estradiol, which is in blue. The uh, progesterone is in yellow here. Do the math, divide it out, and we can see the progesterone E2 ratio is 59, which is low, right? This is the goal, 100 to 500. You can also look at the dials. We really, you know, at, at Dutch, the report is really situated to where you can eyeball these things too. You can see her estradiol is much higher than the normal range. The progesterone hasn't left the building. Clearly, this patient is quite estrogen dominant, maybe, maybe anovulatory, the cycle even. Well, here's a, a slightly harder one to spot. Uh, estradiol is very high, yes. But so is the beta-pregnane dial. It's tip top of the range. So this is one where you might want to do the math. And they technically fall into the normal 
PGE2 ratio range for a luteal sample. But do you notice some of these high estrogens down here, all the way down these pathways, you know, high 16s, high 4s? Um, and we'll, we'll unpack some of these estrogen metabolites and kind of determine which ones have the most uh, impact on how a patient feels as far as what their estrogens feel like in their body. Um, but we're still suspecting estrogen dominance just by looking all the way down these pathways. Here's the cycle map that goes with that last one. Um, what's the assessment now? I mean, if we look at the follicular estrogen levels, they're pretty much jumping off the page. Um, you know, the uh, luteal output of progesterone does get high enough probably to cover some of that, which is why the PGE2 ratio is so good in the mid-luteal phase. But there are other times in the cycle where that estrogen is completely inappropriately high. So you can see how helpful a cycle map can be when you're assessing fully an estrogen dominant presentation that maybe looks pretty normal in the luteal phase. There can be other times when estrogens are higher and you might miss it, uh, or at least a day three, maybe an E2, FSH, and LH that's collected earlier in the cycle might have caught that high estrogen there. So this patient complained of a pan cycle breast tenderness. That was her presenting complaint, very estrogen dominant presentation and maybe would have missed it if you would have looked just, just at a luteal sample. All right, so here's a question I get sometimes, um, just to bring it back around to progesterone, kind of easy to get off on the estrogen train. We're talking about estrogen dominance. It does kind of take the front seat. But um, we get this question an awful lot because beta pregnane diol is the main progesterone metabolite that correlates with progesterone in circulation. Why do we test alpha pregnane diol at all? Um, well, in the steroid hormone pathway chart here, um, uh, here are the five alpha reductase enzymes I'm highlighting here. These enzymes change all of our hormones into metabolites that are still active, or a lot of them are still active at the tissue level. Uh, in the case of progesterone, let's see here, in the case of alpha pregnane diol, um, we're thinking of you know, its ability to bind GABA receptors. In the testosterone metabolism, DHT binds androgen receptors of you know, five or six times the binding affinity that the testosterone does. Um, so you know, 5-alpha, we want to have eyes on some of those downstream metabolites. THF, the alpha form of THF, is not one that has tissue activity. It is a trash <clears throat> product, but there is some more emerging research on the alpha to beta THF ratio that might tell us a little bit about insulin resistance being a driver. So we like putting eyes on those 5-alpha metabolites if we can. They tend to give us good information. In the case of progesterone, progesterone's alpha metabolite, uh, allopregnanolone, binds GABA receptors uh, in the CNS, and they turn on inhibitory activities, and it makes us feel relaxed. Um, and it really dictates how progesterone feels in our body. We put topical progesterone onto our skin or on the back of our neck, or we take a dose of oral progesterone. The effect is that it's very relaxing. It's, it's inhibitory. Um, so uh, how progesterone feels in the body is going to be dictated by how well we're converting down the 5-alpha reductase pathway into the progesterone metabolites that are binding GABA receptors, and also how well it's opposing estrogen's uh, sort of tissue excitatory activity and proliferation in some of our other tissues, like the breast and endometrium uh, and the brain. Well, this seems like a good time to slide in a little info about the paradoxical GABA response. Um, and PMDD in particular. If you've ever prescribed progesterone in your practice, you have probably noticed that some people hate it. Um, and you've probably heard how some people feel really great during the follicular phase, but when the luteal phase comes along and they've ovulated and their progesterone levels come up, they feel terrible again. A lot of those symptoms associated with, uh, with that paradoxical GABA are um, mood and sort of mental, emotional sort of presentation symptoms. And anger seems to be at the root uh, of some of those uh, presentations. So uh, I've even had patients complain of uh, feeling homicidal during the luteal phase or in that week following, you know, all, coming up to the period. So listen for those symptoms, and they may be telling you about a uh, sort of a, a GABA subunit 
issue that doesn't allow the GABA receptor to respond appropriately to alpha metabolites of progesterone. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to give somebody more progesterone when they have this uh, issue. There may be multiple approaches, but I just wanted to kind of put in some ideas for you on how to approach the patient with, especially when you suspect that this issue might be occurring. Um, a few of the treatment options could be suppressing ovulation totally and not allowing their progesterone levels to come up. Um, some people really do well with that type of support. Um, a lot of us kind of shy away from that type of uh, therapy and try to work with the body and maybe overcome some of that GABA uh, issue and overrun it with superphysiologic progesterone dosing. That's also been written up in studies a couple of times. Um, and you can also inhibit 5-alpha reductase activity. I mean, that could be a great way to get progesterone levels up without allowing it to disturb the neurochemistry too much. Uh, and those are things like reishi and green tea extract and uh, nettle root, saw palmetto. Okay, so here's our recap of progesterone. Progesterone is made in the adrenals uh, all cycle, all the way through from follicular phase, even in menses, the adrenals are pumping out progesterone all the way to the end of the cycle, even when the ovaries have kicked in. Um, it forms GABAergic neurosteroids that make us feel relaxed. Um, through the 5-alpha reductase pathway, and it's calming and estrogen opposing. And here are those baseline progesterone levels way at the bottom of the range, all cycle long, and then the ovaries kick in and we get that extra progesterone output during the luteal phase. But we always have that baseline noise of adrenal output. All right, so step one is gonna be to raise progesterone, especially when you find a low uh, progesterone estradiol ratio, or somebody has frankly low progesterone levels, we want to raise that progesterone because that's going to be the thing that, you know, opposes that uh, excitatory sort of stimulatory tissue proliferative activity of estradiol. How do we do that? Um, when we're approaching someone with estrogen dominance and low progesterone, you choose uh, non-hormonal therapies. They may be herbal, they may be nutritional. The goal is generally to improve egg quality. And there's some ideas here up top for improving egg quality. A lot of times, you know, the CoQ10, the mitochondrial supports, the vitamin E, those are going to be kind of payback and dividends after follicles developed and get you more progesterone output during the luteal phase. Um, the other approach is to work with LH modulation and luteal sufficiency. You know, a lot of those LH modulators like myo-inositol and Vitex are really important for lengthening out those luteal phases and improving progesterone output through the uh, entire luteal phase. And before treating low luteal progesterone with hormones, I always suggest just taking a moment, you know, when you're looking at a Dutch test or you're looking at a serum test, um, look at the last menstrual period against the collection date and make sure you're looking at a luteal sample because you know if you caught somebody right at ovulation, they're going to look really estrogen dominant. And they are, but it's normal at that time to be estrogen dominant. Um, and, you know, and, and similar to like if you're looking at a follicular sample, uh, maybe you tested or a patient didn't hear you and they went in for their draw or they collected their Dutch samples on day six of their menstrual cycle, their hormones are all going to look really low and kind of perimenopausal, menopausal. Um, they're not menopausal. They're just collected in the wrong time of the cycle. So just make double sure that they've collected in the right time frame. Um, once you're satisfied you're assessing a luteal sample, then progesterone can be given during the next luteal phase. Um, and that can start making a really big difference in the clinical uh, symptoms. So don't be afraid to go in with progesterones right off the bat, even if you're not ready to deep dive into the estrogens. This can be a really nice bridge while you're working on deeper issues. Um, so you can often treat estrogen dominance solely by addressing the progesterone. That's at least half of the equation right there. It's the numerator. You can increase the numerator. You're going to decrease somebody's estrogen dominance symptoms. Um, that gives you the time to figure out in the long-term game plan for the estrogens. Um, and there are several options for treating with progesterone. You can go with transdermal applications and topicals, um, some of the topical oils. Sometimes people will use sublingually. Um, I'll give you a slide right after this one that kind of goes into some of the clinical pearls with crossing and figuring out what your deliveries need to be. 
but the uh, most often used, I would say, would be transdermal, oral, and vaginal progesterone, whether it's suppositories or the labial applications. But I think, you know, how you use it, the deliveries that you choose are going to somewhat depend on what the patient presentation is. So the delivery is going to affect where the progesterone acts and how it feels in the body. And so the orals, for instance, are very relaxing. They're sleep-inducing. We tend to use them before bedtime, and they really can improve the circadian rhythm for people. Um, they are very quickly metabolized, and they're gone really quickly. I feel like, you know, sometimes people need a, a BID dosing kind of a regimen, or they need to be on a, a topical at the same time as an oral progesterone. Maybe the topical lasts a little bit longer. Um, so think about that when you're prescribing an oral. The sublinguals act like orals, so um, most of the time people are swallowing a little bit of that, so they are also relaxing similarly. So when you're prescribing a sublingual progesterone, usually you have people take it before bed just in case. You know, you don't want somebody getting behind the wheel, going to work, having taken a bunch of progesterone, they feel really drowsy. Um, topical deliveries, uh, I find that the above the waist applications like the arms and like the back of the neck can be relaxing, kind of similar to the orals and the sublinguals, um, but below the waist, they're more local to um, pelvic complaints, so endometrial and, and even um, PMS, like pain during ovulation. Sometimes those uh, uh, below the waist, you know, in the, the sort of inner thigh applications can be really helpful. And then with vaginal, the suppositories may have a greater effect at the cervix and endometrium. So um, think about that, you know, in patients who tend to have heavy bleeding and a lot of over proliferation of the endometrium, they may do better with, you know, a suppository or a vaginal application of progesterone. If you insert the suppository up in the top third of the vaginal vault, you're gonna get more systemic circulation. It's a little more vascular up there versus the labial applications are gonna keep things a little more local. I think pelvic complaints there. And a note on using pregnenolone to increase progesterone, you can totally do that. Um, but pregnenolone therapies only modestly increase uh, adrenal output of progesterone. So pregnenolone and progesterone both break down to the same pregnane diols, and the Dutch test is gonna kinda of look like your progesterone is getting up into the luteal ranges. It's not. Um, if you test progesterone in serum with an oral pre pregnenolone on board, use LCMS because the immunoassays are going to pick up those pregnenediol metabolites and the progesterone metabolites that are generated through first pass, and it's going to quantify that as progesterone, and you're going to think that your progesterone level is a lot higher than it really is. So if you are monitoring oral pregnenolone with serum progesterone, use LCMS methodology, not immunoassay. So check for that. So that was step one, easy, right? Um, now we're gonna get into kind of a little bit of the estrogen weeds, and this is where the Dutch test assessment is gonna be really, really helpful. So step two is assessing estrogens directly. So you might have guessed that the progesterone estradiol ratio is not the be all end all, otherwise, this whole webinar would be about the progesterone estradiol ratio. Um, estradiol is the other half, right? And by itself, it is an inadequate half. The estradiol itself is only part of the story. We can think about all of these metabolites that still have estrogenic activity and engage estrogen receptors um, and have the, you know, the ability to turn on growth promoting uh, properties. So we really want to look into the metabolites of estrogen as well as estradiol. So here is the quick and dirty, kind of similar to what we did with progesterone, uh, but with estrogen, notice how many active metabolites of estrogen we have. We've got these four hydroxies and 16 hydroxies that combined ER alpha receptors. Um, the two hydroxies are really gentle and have more affinity for the betas than the alphas, which are um, much less stimulating than ER alpha and really thought of as protective when we can engage them. These tend to be anti-tumor. So we really have key ones that we're looking for, the fours and the 16s. We're gonna unpack those in the coming slides. But they really have a, an impact on how estrogens feel in the body. 
Um, estradiol itself has 100% affinity for ER alpha and ER beta, but a lot of its metabolites are still estrogenic. So when we see elevated estrogens like here with estrone, estradiol is tip top of the range, um, and E3 is high, when we see these highs on a Dutch test, um, it can mean that there's high amounts of estrogen being produced and entering circulation and tissues seeing those estrogens, uh, or it can mean that there is high bioavailable fraction of estrogen. Remember, at the Dutch test and urine uh, hormones are bioavailable fraction. So this is all a hormone that was not attached to uh, carrier binding proteins. So to figure that out, uh, I always recommend using a custom serum panel to speak to exactly what's in circulation um, and in transit to the tissues. So we'll talk about what's in that in the next few slides here. So just want to create an understanding of what serum is telling us versus what urine is telling us, because you know invariably we're we're going to be looking at multiple body fluids for a patient who is uh, coming in with estrogen dominance complaints, whether it's you know, saliva or blood spot or serum or urine, we're putting together these expectations of what this body fluid might be telling us versus what that body fluid might be telling us. In this case, um, serum and urine give you two sides of, of the same story. Serum gives you info about hormone that was produced and, you know, hormones that are mostly bound in transit to tissues or, you know, or to the liver. And urine gives you what's bioavailable, what happened after that hormone was taken up and was utilized in the tissues. That's more, you know, uh, tissue uptake and metabolism. That's what enters the urine. It's what happened after, after the tissues took it up. So when I see a high set of estrogens on a Dutch test and I look at my companion serum report, I'm really, you know, um, thinking about, well, what is, what's the SHBG level? Is SHBG really low? And that's why we're seeing these high estrogens in the urine. You know, maybe that's our big opportunity to treat things that, that lower SHBG. And if we can limit how much estrogen is coming through to the tissues, that can change somebody's experience of how estrogen feels in the body. Um, if they have high inflammatory markers, if they have, uh, anyway, we'll go over all of this. So this goes into the assessment. Let's talk about SHBG because this is a really big piece. Sex hormone binding globulin binds to both estradiol and testosterone in serum. The serum is a watery body fluid and lipophilic hormones don't travel through um, in, in high amounts. Usually they are bound to these, these carrier proteins that can handle the water. Um, high sex hormone binding globulin decreases the bioavailable fraction of estradiol and testosterone. So there's less available for tissue uptake and lower estrogens in the urine. So, uh, and vice versa. When uh, SHBG is low, there's more estrogen bioavailable to the tissues and urine estrogens are gonna be really, really high. So because urine represents that bioavailable fraction, it's helpful to know what the SHBG level is. So um, uh, low SHBG, maybe this doesn't surprise you at all, but it's going to usually accompany a lot of your high estrogen presentations and estrogen dominance pictures um, yeah, that walk into your office. So here are kind of a list of some of the things that are associated with low and high SHBG. I am focusing a little bit on the low SHBG ones because low SHBG increases estrogen bioavailability and increases that uh, estrogen metabolite load that some people are carrying around. Keep that low SHBG list in mind. Remember the metabolic syndrome stuff, fatty liver, hyperandrogenism, hypothyroid, uh, uh, obesity, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. So keeping that in mind, we want to think about a serum panel to accompany a mid-luteal Dutch test, it might want to have some blood sugar markers in there, um, a liver function panel, a thyroid panel, um, vitamin D influences the way we metabolize estrogens um, and is often low in some of those low SHBG presentations. Um, and then some of the day three sex hormones and inflammatory markers. These are really important pieces of information to put together with your Dutch test which looks at luteal sex hormones and adrenal hormones, including cortisol, 
um, and that should be collected in the mid-luteal phase. So you have two parts of the cycle to look at. Really kind of rounds out your assessment of the estrogen dominant patient. So let's get back to the estrogen uh, metabolites for a second, and we'll look at hormone detox patterns on a Dutch, especially the estrogens, because many of those estrogen metabolites have independent hormonal effects at the tissue level. Um, they do their own thing. So here are some examples, like here, 16-hydroxy and 4-hydroxy uh, E1 and E2 have affinity for ER alpha receptors. That's all I needed to hear. You know, we're still binding estrogen receptors and turning on proliferative activity. Uh, even if it didn't have the implications for breast cancer risk and oxidative stress potential, um, but they do. And so when we think about it from a preventive standpoint, controlling the 4-hydroxy estrogens and controlling the 16-hydroxy estrogens may have implications to preventing breast and endometrial cancer in the future. So here's step two. Treat those transitional states of estrogen and target the pathways. Phase one detox or hydroxylation is the first step in estrogen clearance. And all these metabolites require further biotransformation. The twos and the fours need to get methylated. The 16-hydroxy estrogen needs to get sulfated. So we're really looking for the right ratios of the two hydroxies to the more oxidative four hydroxies. And same thing with the two hydroxies versus the 16 hydroxies. And they play into how risky those estrogens are. So if you wanted to correct all the pathways at once, so you know, keep this page, uh, address all the causes as they exist in the patient, and support the CYP1A1, that's this pathway here, um, and modulate CYP1B1, the bad pathway, and the CYP3A4. So these guys are the ones that lead to um, you know, estrogenic activity. They're associated with inflammation and low vitamin D levels, infections, you know, all of those things that influence our estrogen metabolism in a bad way have a promotional activity towards CYP1B1 and CYP3A4. So if you want to treat the cause, work here. Treat these, these causes of metabolism issues and support CYP1A1 so that we make more of the two hydroxy estrogens, the, the two methoxy uh, estrogens, or even anti-proliferative anti-tumor at the tissue level. And these are all supports that have been studied. You know, you can do a PubMed search and see how these have been studied and what kind of doses they were used in the studies. And, you know, there are some wonderful treatment plans you can come up with just this slide alone. Um, so don't be afraid to use it. So how do we visualize those estrogen pathways uh, as E2 clears through the body on a Dutch test? Well, this is really kind of it. Um, it's, uh, it's laid out, well, let's start with the presentation. This is a 44-year-old female with heavy menses. She has regular cycles. She has bloating. Sounds like estrogen dominance, right? So we want to look at a Dutch test. You can look at her progesterone E2 ratio here. So progesterone's low, proge you know, estrogen's high. We already know that's going to be a very low PGE2 ratio. It's 6.4. We're probably going to want to use some progesterone with her. Um, and then we also want to look at her pathways, right? This is step two. We're digging a little bit more deeply than just progesterone at this point. We're looking at how she's moving through her estrogens, and we can assess her pie chart and see that that is way too blue. Um, the blue pathway leads to the 16-hydroxy estrogens, and these guys are very estrogenic, turning on proliferative processes. And the 4-hydroxys, these are upregulated by inflammation, uh, and toxic exposures and all kinds of things we don't want. Um, and the 4-hydroxy estrogens are the ones that famously can go on to form reactive quinones and damage the DNA. Downstream, downstream, downstream uh, are sort of uh, theorized to be one of the causes of, of DNA adducts and cancer uh, initiation. So we want to keep these guys under control. Could these be part of why she has the heavy bleeding with cycles and the, and the bloating? you know, um, partially, probably. And then we have other parts of the Dutch test that we'll unpack a little bit later too um, to sort of add to our assessment. Uh, but we're going to learn what drives these pathways so we can go a step further. And we'll start with four hydroxy estrogens first. We'll talk about drivers and busters. 
So CYP1B1 drives the 4-hydroxy pathway, and 4-hydroxy estrogens are driven by inflammation. When you see high 4-hydroxy estrogen, if you think inflammation, I will be so happy uh, because that's usually it. It's usually it. Uh, it usually will correlate with a high CRP um, in the bloodstream. Um, sometimes it is these other things. Sometimes people have a FAST-type CYP1B1 SNP. Sometimes people are dealing with hypothyroid. Sometimes there's vitamin D deficiency. Sometimes there are mold toxins. There can be a whole slew of other reasons somebody has a high 4-hydroxy. Uh, but think inflammation first. That's your horse. <clears throat> and here's a little refresher slide on how to address 4-hydroxy estrogens. The most famous way to do that probably is to use the bioflavonoids bioflavonoids and, and uh, polyphenols. So I did just kind of make a little listing of some of the ones that are most often used. Um, you might find more research on these um, if you type in the condition and, bio, you know, and the bioflavonoid you're interested in, like quercetin fibroids or um, you know, inflammation citrus bioflavonoids. Um, rather than typing in, you know, 4-hydroxyestrone and citrus bioflavonoids, though there may be some studies. So sometimes you have to get a little uh, creative with your PubMed searches, but the information is there and the information is good. And um, utilize these supports to control heavy bleeding in patients uh, who have high 4-hydroxyestrogens and do support phase 2 detox. Um, I can't underscore it enough, you know, when phase one metabolism is off, if you go the next phase down and support that uh, methylation of 4-hydroxys, that's one way of protecting our tissues from 4-hydroxy estrogens, you know, cap, cap those methyl groups on there. Um, and improve sulfation as well. You know, a sulfated hormone cannot bind its receptor, including 4-hydroxy estrogens. So think about phase two detox as well. So let's circle back around to our 44-year-old with heavy periods and bloating. Knowing some of the drivers of 4-hydroxyestrogens, I mean, my money would be on inflammation, right? Because she's got these two, you know, 4-hydroxy and 16-hydroxy pathways that are up. You could already start to fill in some great anti-inflammatory treatment plan, you know, for her heavy periods, um, for going after the 4-hydroxys with the bioflavonoids. Um, and, and we learned about even more therapies on the 4-hydroxy the slide that preceded here, with maybe some phase 2 detox support. Let's look at the 16s. Um, yeah, oh, yes. Compare the 4-hydroxys with the inflammatory and thyroid markers. Go back to your serum panel and, and find your opportunities to treat that are a little bit deeper. Um, now for 16-hydroxy. All right. Drivers and busters. So drivers uh, of CYP3A4 or the 16-hydroxy pathway are many, but the high points I would say are obesity itself, moderate alcohol consumption, which we're running into an awful lot after COVID, um, pesticide exposure, smoking, caffeine. Um, there are medications that can influence this pathway activity and even some supplements. St. John's wort is probably the most famous one that upregulates this pathway activity. Um, so the things I think about quite a bit when I see a high 16-hydroxy is autoimmune, high prolactin, gut inflammation. You know, these are all things that I'm, you know, bandying about in my head when I see a really blue pie chart and a very high 16-hydroxy estrone. And the caveat is that 16-hydroxy uh, estrone feels very estrogenic in the body, you know. It's one that binds those estrogen receptors, the ER alphas, but it binds covalently. It doesn't fall off. You know, it's on there until that receptor degrades. It doesn't act like a normal estrogen at an estrogen receptor. Um, so keep those in check. Um, drivers of low activity, and I just wanted to kind of drop this in here because low activity of CYP3A4 can be problematic too. Um, you know, too much is a bad thing, but too little can be a bad thing too. So we want to check for low vitamin D when CYP3A4 activity is low and 16-hydroxy is low compared to some of the other metabolites. Um, check for systemic inflammation. That can drive low 16-hydroxyestrone. Um, even chronic infections and people who drink a lot of grapefruit juice. Um, so think about 
especially vitamin D being low when 16-hydroxy is low. Most of the time, we're going to be working to bust 16-hydroxy, especially in our estrogen-dominant folks, um, because it's so often elevated. So have a look through some of these ways. If you have a sense of what may be causing that fire hydrant to kind of point towards the 16s, work that angle directly, like correct an iodine deficiency or deliver uh, anti-inflammatories to the gut or feed the CYP1A1 pathway a little bit uh, to help form the two hydroxy estrogens, the good guys. So there are many detox support products out there that uh, essentially put a lot of these elements together so you can kind of hedge your bets. Uh, medical foods, encapsulated products. Um, I do want to unpack a little bit DIM or diendolyl methane because it's such a popular supplement for estrogen dominance. It, it really is one of our most potent therapeutics for decreasing parent estrogens and a high 16 hydroxy E1. So it's known to strongly usher estrogens down that 2 hydroxy pathway or CYP1A1 pathway here. Um, and it, so you really, I'm going to show you some labs. You're going to love this. Um, this is favorable because the 2-methoxy-E1 has the anti-proliferative properties at the tissue level. Um, and it's, you know, considered anti-tumor for that reason. And um, it's also uh, something that's going to decrease breast density. So for a lot of reasons and estrogen dominance complaints, DIM can be a really great thing. So here's a case for which DIM was the primary intervention. So they used uh, 200 milligrams of DIM for six months, and then they retested. And you can see how powerfully, there we go, uh, some of these natural agents are for increasing the 2-hydroxy estrogen metabolism. That's huge, you know? And the parent estrogens, these are really big estrogens coming in six months later. She's normal, right? And most importantly, look at the 16 hydroxys coming way down to the bottom end of the normal luteal range. That's pretty fantastic. So that's one way to rearrange estrogen metabolism when the parent estrogens are high and the 16 hydroxy estrone is high. You're looking for really those three things right there. If you could draw a little triangle around that. But here's a different example. Patient tested because they had um, estrogen dominant parts to their complaint, like severe migraines can be an estrogen dominance complaint. Um, so it can mood swings. So naturally, we're wanting to look at a Dutch. Um, the high points um, are, you know, in the second report here on the right, um, she had been on DIM for over a year and had reached a pretty good, you know, migraine control point. But you can see, you know, her estrogens weren't all that elevated at the beginning, and her 16-hydroxy certainly wasn't high. If anything, it was low compared to the 2-hydroxy. But they still employed DIM, and you can see how it affected the pie chart. She's almost got nothing coming through these, uh, excuse me, nothing coming through the 16 hydroxy pathway. But the 2 hydroxy is lit up. It's done exactly what it's supposed to do. It's decreasing the E1 and E2. You know, one of the mechanisms of uh, DIM that remember from the last slide is that it raises sex hormone binding globulin. And so we do see less E1 and E2 bioavailable and being taken up by tissues and being metabolized down. So it really is good at controlling estrogen levels into a really tight box for somebody who has migraines that can be a lifesaver. So let's apply our knowledge of DIM as we look at our 44-year-old uh, with heavy menses. We're already thinking about some bioflavonoids to help her for hydroxies, and that may help to stem some of her heavy bleeding um, in the endometrium because the bioflavonoids downregulate estrogen receptor activity there uh, in, in the endometrium. So uh, what about the 16 hydroxies? Yes, we can get after this pathway. Maybe we need to use some DIM, right? So we've kind of teed that up, and we know what's going to happen with DIM. The 16 hydroxy estrogens are going to come way down, the parent estrogens are going to come way down, and the 2 hydroxy is going to go way up, right? You can almost see the writing on the wall. And I would say supporting methylation is really helpful. When you bring DIM on for somebody, even if they have an okay methylation, this is where, I'm going to circle it for you, this is where we can assess COMT activity. Um, when you have more metabolism coming down a pathway, and we're going to be stressing that COMT enzyme family a little bit more, support methylation, even if they look okay. And that's because more estradiol coming through may be a bit of an inhibitor to that COMT activity. So 
shore that up before you get to that place. You don't want to build up too much. To dim or not to dim? That is the question. I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with that. Um, but here we have a different 44-year-old. This is a 44-year-old female, weight loss resistant, and they were wanting to look at the Dutch because she had some other estrogen dominant symptoms as well. Um, she kind of has a strangely normal or low metabolite low, uh, load all the way down compared to her parent estrogens. So we might immediately be thinking about DIM for her. Um, the 2-hydroxy-E1 super low, even in the postmenopausal range. So that seems kind of risky, especially when the 16 hydroxies are at the tip top of the range. So there are all kinds of things that you can kind of spatially look at when you're looking at these pathways all in the same place at the same time. Um, but she also has a high for age total DHEA when we add together the DHEA metabolites with DHEA sulfate. That's a pretty big total DHEA for somebody who's 44, and those ranges are here. Um, you know, so we're already thinking about, you know, maybe androgens driving some of this estrogen formation. Um, we're already thinking that next step further and like, where are these estrogens coming from? We can see some estrogen metabolism problems, maybe not sending enough down into the two hydroxies. And then, you know, other things we can look at on the Dutch test can point towards other etiologies of estrogen too, like indican when it's elevated can tell us about reabsorption of estrogens at the GI tract potentially from a dysbiotic gut. So we've already got a pretty diverse treatment plan for this 44-year-old patient who's weight loss resistant, really just looking at one page of the, the Dutch test and, and maybe you know, a couple of oats. So um, let's look at another one. What if you have a case like this where uh, the 16-hydroxy-E1 is high, but there really aren't any high estrogen symptoms? This person has more androgen symptoms. Uh, and I brought this one on because we run into this an awful lot. Um, remember that 16-hydroxy-E1 can feel very androgenic to some patients. And you will notice that DHEA metabolism comes through androstene dione, which can aromatize down into estrone and create this direct highway for 16-hydroxy formation. So, you know, it kind of makes sense to cross-check, um, you know, a serum panel, you're maybe looking for drivers of DHEA production um, and looking for these estrogens to be more of a sign of high DHEA maybe in the serum. Um, so how do we address this patient? You know, we could use things like DIM and I3C. Those are going to increase sex hormone binding globulin, decrease these parent estrogens, reroute metabolism to the twos. That could be an option. You know, or we could go straight in with sulfation supports and help to decrease the, um, well, maybe even all the way up top here, decrease some of this DHEA conversion down into androstene dione to begin with, keep that DHEA as sulfated as possible. That's one way. And then remember, the 16s and the estriol have to sulfate out. So if they're building up, that could be a sign of hyposulfation. And remember, a sulfated estrogen cannot bind its receptor. So those might all be ways to uh, improve this patient's complaint of hair loss and acne. Last one, dim or no dim. This patient has symptoms of both high and low estrogens, heavy menses, mood swings, night sweats, right? Um, so in a case like this where there's really no sign of high estrogen production, right? E1 and E2 look pretty low um, outside of that uh, 16 hydroxy level and estriol, it probably makes the most sense to skip the DIM. So this would be an example of skip the DIM. Um, opt for sulfation supports and sulforaphane, which help to clear 16 hydroxy and estriol through improving sulfation, increasing salt 2A1 and, two, and uh, 2E1 production expression. So uh, fix up that low B6 for moods. Here's a, an oats marker that we're looking at, the xanthurinate and kynurinate, um, showing a low B6, you know. So we're able to kind of address the estrogen metabolism, also the nutritional deficiency that might be leading to some of those mood swings, um, and then uh, go for phase three metabolism support since her uh, indican level was up. 
So you're already seeing how we can come up with a pretty diverse treatment plan for somebody who's having high and low estrogen symptoms that may be related to a few different parts of the uh, uh, laboratory picture. So let's talk about sulforaphane, um, since we teed it up in our last slide. This is a pinch hitter, really, for um, that really that everyone should know about. We think about DIM because it's so powerful for upregulating that 2-hydroxy metabolism, but sulforaphane is a gentle phase one mover. It's going to be less of a you know, downward ratchet for E1 and E2. It doesn't have that same effect on sex hormone binding globulin, so it doesn't change the bioavailability of estrogen to the target tissues. Um, but what it does is it does improve phase one metabolism gently, but it's a powerful phase two detox support. So you're gonna get a lot of support for methylation, sulfation, glucuronidation, um, glutathionation, everything that we need to get those um, phase one metabolites of estrogen really silenced on the way out of the body. Um, it also protects the DNA from the 4-hydroxy estrogens by upregulating quinone reductase enzyme expression. So you get more uh, quinone reductase keeping the 4-hydroxys cleaved apart from the um, reactive or, or from the neighboring quinone, so it can't form those complexes to damage the DNA. So sulforaphane would be really helpful for that person who doesn't really have high estrogens. Maybe their um, SHBG level is, uh, is high or on the normal side, and we really are trying to reroute 16-hydroxy or 4-hydroxy metabolism back into the 2-hydroxy pathway without losing too much parent estrogen. And step three, identify the source of estrogen and treat there. So this is going to be the last step in our little protocol for assessing a, and approaching the estrogen-dominant patient. In the last slide, we learned about step two, which was how to treat the detox pathways and really help to protect the tissues from estrogenic uh, transitional metabolites. Um, next, I want to dive into step three, which is all about how to figure out where those estrogens are coming from at, so that we can create a foundational treatment plan and really help resolve the adapted detox pattern so that somebody doesn't have to be on supplements for the rest of their lives. We want to be able to adopt a healthy kind of lifestyle plan to sustain long term. So what systems are contributing to circulating estradiol levels? There are potentially several, um, more than just the ovaries, I guess, uh, it turns out. So the ovaries make E2 within a self-regulated system here with um, you know, estradiol and inhibin feeding back to the brain to limit FSH and LH. Um, so that's a pretty closed system for the, for the most part. Uh, adipose tissue um, pumps up uh, estrogens. Uh, it upregulates the 3-beta HSD and aromatase through insulin and uh, inflammation. And so we do see a superhighway into estrogens from DHEA. Um, and I'll show you how to, how to recognize that on a Dutch test. And finally, that leads us to our adrenal output of estradiol, which is really our, representing our kind of baseline estradiol output. You know, ACTH upregulates um, the production of a lot of our hormones, and, and same thing with, with estrogens. And there's just kind of this baseline noise of estrogen output that we even see in postmenopause. That's always there. Um, so the adrenals make small follicular levels of estradiol unless it's under high stress. And, uh, and then the gut, which houses our estrogen recycling system, essentially, I guess is, is what I'm calling it here. And it really is. It's an estrogen catch system that can, you know, cleave the glucuronide bond off of uh, estradiol and many of our estrogens and bring them right back into circulation so that we can reutilize them or re-metabolize them. And some people have a dysbiotic gut that is high in beta-glucuronidase activity, and they reabsorb too much estrogen. They're just over-recycling estrogen, and that in itself can be problematic. Um, so we want to look for signs of that on a Dutch test as well. So let's start with the ovarian source ones. These are a little bit easier because we don't run into this one so much unless you have your perimenopausal maybe, or if you're at some PCOS patients will have trouble with their negative feedback system. Um, but you'll always want to cross-check with other Dutch lab markers, like 
I like to look at epitestosterone when I'm assessing ovarian output. Um, if your epitestosterone is really, really high and your ovarian sourced estrogens are really, really high, that can kind of be a confirmatory sign that some of these things are, are, are ovarian sourced. Um, so I'll show you how to do that. And here's an example. And actually, this isn't an example of a high epitestosterone, but I did pull the androgens out just so you can see where to look um, when you're assessing for um, what's the source of high estrogen. So this patient is 49 years old. And whenever somebody is 49 and they're perimenopausal and they're kind of working towards that transition, when we see high estrogens, we should be thinking about high FSH. Um, FSH and LH levels are rising in perimenopause, and it's not unusual to see high ovarian output of estrogens during that time because of that. Um, often, we will also see epitestosterone levels uh, high as well, or at least in this luteal range. Um, sometimes it can be at the higher end of the luteal range, especially if someone has a history of PCOS. Um, but this is a good example to be thinking that direction. 49 years old, high FSH, maybe high LH and anovulatory, looking at her progesterone levels being very low there, right? This is a very estrogen dominant picture. Um, so usually we choose therapies that increase functional ovarian reserve, egg quality, uh, and improve the, you know, the idea is we wanna improve the ovarian response essentially and keep people cycling as comfortably as we can all the way through to menopause where they just kind of, one day they wake up, they don't have a period ever again and they didn't even notice they were in perimenopause and that would be great. Um, and some of the therapeutics we might choose could be herbal in nature. A lot of the phytoestrogens are increasing ovarian response to FSH. Um, sometimes we'll use glandular therapies like bovine or porcine glandulars. Um, and myo-inositol is kind of a big um, uh, tissue sensitivity support that can help us respond better to FSH and LH. And then for improving functional ovarian reserve, you know, I always think about methylfolate, and there's so much good stuff that's been studied in the, uh, in the IVF and embryo transfer kind of realm um, of research, and melatonin is starting to emerge, NAC, omega-3s, you know, a lot of the anti-inflammatory supports and mitochondrial supports make a lot of sense here. Uh, and a Mediterranean-style diet, I mean, that's something that people can implement tonight um, and could have an impact on their functional ovarian reserve. So that's estrogen coming from ovaries. Let's talk about adipose source estrogens next. Um, and my silly little picture here. Um, adrenals supply the DHEA. I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, but adipose tissue has all of the enzyme machinery upregulated by insulin and interleukin-6 um, that lead DHEA through the pathway into estradiol and estrone. So um, obesity is also associated with high CYP3A4 conversion of estrone, this guy right here, into 16-hydroxy. Um, so anyway, I've highlighted high DHEA sulfate in the serum or high total DHEA in the urine. Um, but I would say because DHEA is kind of a pro-hormone, and I'll go over that in the next slide, 16-hydroxy-E1 and estriol may be where you're wearing your DHEA. You know, so I think this is one that I would highlight on a Dutch test to really identify, are these estrogens adipose sourced or something else? Look for the 16-hydroxy and the estriol. So the adrenals uh, adjust our DHEA production on a CTH signaling from the brain. So when we're under stress, we're insulin resistant, maybe we have high prolactin levels, we make more DHEA. So DHEA metabolism can head in a couple of different directions. So it can head down through androstenedione into estrone. It can also head down through testosterone into estradiol. So DHEA is a pro-hormone um, because urine is post-tissue uptake and conversion has been made, including down through the, into the 16-hydroxy estrogens, um, sometimes the urinary total DHEA doesn't always match up perfectly with the DHEA sulfate that you might catch in the serum. So look for high 16-hydroxy-E1 in those patients where the DHEAs aren't matching up. Usually total DHEA in urine matches up nicely with DHEA sulfate in serum. 
That's a nice correlation, unless somebody has a high conversion into the estrogens through adipose tissue. So if you're suspecting that, look at 16-hydroxy-E1. That's the takeaway of this slide, really. Is estrone a bad estrogen? We get this question an awful lot. Um, so DHEA is connected to estrone through androstenedione, like we were saying. And um, is estrone a bad estrogen? I would say it's gotten a much lower affinity for estrogen receptors than estradiol itself. So in that way, it's not as, as bad as estradiol. But because it has a preference for ER alphas, um, which is very different than, say, estriol, which is considered protective and much more uh, affinity for ER betas, in that way it might be a worse estrogen than estriol. But I consider estrone a bad estrogen because of high androstenedione and a sign of formation of estrogens in adipose tissue. That's really what we're thinking about when we say, oh, estrone's a bad estrogen. It is a weaker estrogen than estradiol, but it is a sign that estrogen is coming from adipose tissue. That's the link. So I just want to introduce some patterns and file these away in your brain. So let's look at an example of how insulin resistance might present on a Dutch test. Uh, you want to notice the high estrone in particular, this guy right here, as well as high DHEA and that hypermetabolic cortisol pattern. Really, really consistent with adipose source-driven estrogens. And we can help you identify these, certainly, when you call in and go over these reports. And here's inflammation. This is very characteristic of high CRP. We have some very high 4-hydroxyestrogens. Um, and I pulled out the 4-hydroxy-E2 as well, also elevated. Uh, and the DHEA metabolites being higher than the sulfated DHEA. These are all really indicative of inflammation even before you see the high Quinn and the high 8 ohdg you know, the oats really kind of tie the bow on top, but this is a very inflamed looking picture. But what do you do about your insulin resistant and inflamed presentations? Here are some ideas. Um, herbal insulin sensitizers and nutritional insulin sensitizers can be really, really powerful. There are also some lovely medications and more to add to that probably with the GLP ones. Um, Anti-inflammatory supports can be lifestyle, they can be diet, um, and, uh, but as far as herbal supports, liposomal curcumin is high on the list, green tea extract, rosemary, medicinal mushrooms, systemic enzyme therapies. So think about all of those. <clears throat> so here's an example of someone with high prolactin levels. When 16-hydroxy-E1 is high like this, see how high that is, and the estrone is elevated, the pituitary has little defense against high 16-hydroxy-estrone. This is an estrogen that doesn't act like other estrogens in the body. It binds covalently to estrogen receptors. It doesn't fall off until the estrogen receptor degrades. And when it binds estrogen receptors in the pituitary, it can really upregulate prolactin output. And prolactin increases DHEA production, and DHEA converts down through androstenedione into more 16-hydroxy. So you can see how this can become a vicious cycle in a way. Um, so thyroid function is often suppressed by prolactin. So um, I always like to put eyes on the cortisol metabolites. Often we'll see a hypometabolic cortisol pattern when uh, prolactin levels are high. And as you treat high prolactin and you get the 16 hydroxy estrogens down with the prolactin, often you'll see a bump up in the cortisol metabolites as a, as a sign that, uh, that your treatment plan is working. So I put together a quick bit on how to approach your high prolactin patients when it's higher than you want and it's causing problems. You want to rule out hypothyroid because TSH is co-released with prolactin, even if it's just transiently high, can cause problems with uh, DHEA production and estrogen metabolism. So check your thyroid patients, get them treated down into a nice tight TSH level, um, and check HBA in the oats because dopamine is our big inhibitor of prolactin. If you have low dopaminergic tone, your prolactin is going to usually run around a little bit too high. Um, and refer for pituitary imaging. You don't want to be, you know, having high, high prolactin levels in your patient's chart and not doing much about it. It's definitely something that really needs to be uh, 
uh, either you know imaged, you want to really confirm that that's not something that needs to be surgically addressed. Uh, and if it is, um, get it done. These things can be managed medically and surgically a lot of times. Um, for idiopathic pesky high prolactin levels that aren't related to micro or macro prolactinomas, um, there are some magic uh, therapies, and there may be other people who have other ideas about this, but I've definitely seen Vitex and DIM together be kind of the magic combo. Because um, remember, Vitex increases the dopamine centrally, and you get that opposition to prolactin, and then DIM cuts off the 16 hydroxy driver. Um, that that uh, you know increases prolactin output and really kind of cuts it off on two sides. And last but certainly not least, uh, gut source estrogens. So we're going to run into this an awful lot if you do a lot of hormone testing, um, and these can be hard to spot even on a Dutch test. But but we have some extra markers on the Dutch test now that may help let you know when maybe a stool test would be a good option. Um, high endocrine levels in the urine can be a sign that a stool test is in order in particular. So here's a good example of, or an actual example of an estrogen dominant symptom presentation where um, the patient is wearing her estrogens in the 16 hydroxy pathway, right? That pie chart is way too blue, the two hydroxy estrogens way too low, and even in the postmenopausal range, this, this patient's only 26, that's not normal. Um, so we know there's something going on there, and um, I'm thinking about insulin resistance probably because, you know, her androgens are pretty high and her 16-hydroxy is dominant, maybe inflammation, right, because the sulfated metabolite of DHEA is a lot lower in its range than the androsterone is. So already kind of thinking maybe insulin, maybe uh, inflammation driving, um, but Importantly, and what I was trying to spot here but didn't mention, was the endocrine level is elevated. So we know she's got some gut, some reabsorption of some of these estrogens and recirculation. So we know some of her treatment plan is going to have to be gut-related. Um, and when you're approaching a, a gut case, um, we want to think about maybe doing some stool testing so you can be very specific with your treatment plan. There are a lot of different types of organisms that can... Um, uh, increase beta-glucuronidase activity and increase our circulating estrogens. So uh, do that extra step and do some stool testing. Um, correct digestive problems if they exist. Get the digestion going way up top. Uh, hypochlorhydria can be a reason why endocrine levels are elevated and, um, you know, and acidifying the gut properly can allow our uh, gut microbiome to flourish in a way that downregulates some of that beta-glucuronidase activity. And calcium deglucurate is our mechanical downregulator of beta-glucuronidase activity and is a real important part of our protocols when patients have this uh, issue. So it does keep, keep estrogens kind of glucuronidated and silenced on the way out and really helps with uh, high estrogen symptoms. And of course, support progesterone too. Progesterone estrogen cycling, you know, if you have somebody who's not coming up with progesterone in the luteal phase or for too short, maybe they have a, an insufficient luteal phase, that's not going to give you the adequate progesterone stimulation to our gut microbiome to kind of that push and pull of estrogen and progesterone um, really helps our gut microbiome diversity and volume flourish. There are, of course, some other mechanical, kind of mechanical drivers of estrogens, um, and I, I didn't mean to toss those under the rug. They are very important, the adenomyosis, ovarian cysts, endometriosis, fibroids, pregnancy. There are all kinds of reasons that your body might be pumping out estrogens. Find them. Usually we do uh, identify them through imaging, but treats specifically, you know, if there's a surgical approach that needs to be taken, if there is, a, you know, a particular anti-estrogen therapy that needs to be taken because somebody has endometriosis or a fibroid, take that into consideration when you are coming up with your treatment plan uh, for even if you're trying to use progesterone and you know somebody has a fibroid, progesterone can be involved in growing fibroids in some people. So we have to be really careful and kind of know what we're getting into and maybe do extra monitoring for those fibroids if we're going to be using progesterone in those guys. So just a caveat there. 
So I will leave you with this. You've essentially made it to the end with me. Um, I did create a little estrogen dominance workup sheet that I've used quite a bit for myself in the past. Um, and it's designed to synthesize some of the information we get from a Dutch test and a serum panel uh, and help you form a treatment plan out of that. And the idea is to restore balance, resolve symptoms, and go a little deeper to get at, kind of pick at what's going on underneath um, so that somebody doesn't have to be on progesterone replacement therapy for very long, or maybe they don't have to be on phase one detox, you know, estrogen detox movers for very long. We can manage them on, you know, a very targeted sort of lifestyle support that keeps them managed throughout their health span. So step one allows you to fill in the progesterone estradiol ratios for the initial assessment of estrogens. Um, and when somebody has a very high 16-hydroxy or essentially that high CYP3A4 pathway activity, remember the progesterone estradiol ratio in urine is going to be a skewed progesterone dominant. So you always want to go to the step two in those cases. Um, but do address low progesterone if that's a main issue. And there's your ideas for doing that. And then step two is to dig into the estrogens side of things and determine how estrogens feel in the body by looking at the detox pathways and finding the tells. You can look at the balance between the two and the 16 and the balance between the two and the four hydroxies. Those are really telling. If they have a balance towards the fours or the 16s, go after these busters, really work the estrogen metabolism and that's gonna change how the patient wears their estrogen essentially. And step three, this is the most important part. This is what we want to be working on with all of our patients, but these are the longer-term treatment plans. Look for clues on the Dutch test and in your companion serum panel. Find your opportunities to treat the cause of high estrogens and, uh, or even aberrant estrogen metabolism. So that's the inflammation, the insulin resistance, the infections, the low vitamin D. We're really looking for all of these pieces to come together into that longer-term terrain that's going to keep estrogens under control, or, or, or even genetics or stool testing. There may be further testing that's needed too. Um, but these are the three most common drivers of estrogen dominance, you know, the insulin resistance, the inflammation, the gut reabsorption, uh, and egg quality issues and perimenopausal transitions. These are the most common ones that are going to walk in and need your support um, for improving that progesterone to estradiol ratio. And here are my sort of springboard examples of what you could do uh, to go after those. Just like a little worksheet. Well, that's what I've got for you today. Thank you for hanging with me through all of this estrogen shop talk. Um, I hope that it reinforced a few things that you already knew um, and maybe reminded you of a few things you forgot. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you all for joining us today. Watch your inboxes tomorrow for a link to the recording and to access the resources we shared today. You can learn more about the research behind Dutch Test at dutchtest.com slash research. And to make sure to visit the Become a Provider tab at dutchtest.com to register for an account so that you can gain access to even more hormone education and research. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Dutch Test for more hormone education, tips from our clinical experts, and more. Thanks again. Have a great day.